Last week, Hudson's mother, Courtney, uh, came to talk to me after church and uh, mentioned she would like to be baptized. And uh, we talked with her about when she received Christ and uh, is she ready? I mean, she's pretty ready. So uh, <laughs> well, come on down for her. On your profession of faith in Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm going to pray for Courtney. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Courtney. Thank you for her faith in you. And we just praise you, Father that the sister in Christ is uh, committed to you, to follow you. I pray, Lord, you will give her a special blessing. Uh, give her uh, the assurance from your spirit, your, your daughter, your, your child. And, Lord, I just pray her whole family is blessed. I know Travis is blessed, Hudson's blessed. And we just ask God you'll strengthen her and help her to grow and to be the woman of God you called her to be. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 14. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. How many? Once for all. Doesn't it say that? But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, if you had a hard time following that, uh, I'll help you. That's part of my job. Hopefully, you won't leave this place scratching your head. What in the world are you talking about? So we're going to talk about baptism, what baptism symbolizes this morning. Well, let's pray. Let's ask God to help us. Father, I pray for your help in understanding this passage, the glorious truth, what baptism represents, what baptism uh, explains to us. And Lord, I just pray, help me to explain it in a clear way so that we can see the good news in this. I mean, we see the words death and we see all that stuff. It don't sound like it's good, but, but Lord, help us to hear this. Help us to hear the good news and Lord, help us to rejoice in this. And Lord, if there's someone who's not received Christ yet and someone is still trying to figure it out, I pray that this may be the thing that clicks in their mind, that they may understand and see clearly. Uh, your grace, your goodness, your love that's been poured out for them. And I pray you help me to say what I should say. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, there, there's a question here. I want you to see. There's actually two questions in chapter 6. We're just going to focus on the first one. But they're, they're very similar to each other. When he, notice that what he says there in the first verse. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? So in other words, the idea of the question, the question is, God saves us. If we understand the gospel, God saves us by his grace. You all remember the song, Amazing Grace. It's so amazing. Grace is good, okay? So God saves us by his grace. And so the idea is we understand the gospel. We understand we were not saved by our works, but we were saved by God's works and by God's grace. 
And so here's the idea. Understand that we're saved totally by God's grace. Uh, Paul is asking the question, do we sin even more so that God's grace is greater? Now think about Hitler. Say Hitler comes to faith in Christ, and he's saved. Now, you know Hitler sinned a lot. And we say, man, God's grace is even greater on Hitler because Hitler is saved. That His sins were much greater That's versus someone who's just a few sins. So the grace of God was upon Hitler. So the idea goes, so if I want to make God's grace even greater, then I got to keep, keep on sinning, keep sinning, keep sinning. And God's grace and accepting me is even greater. Now, I want you to notice something. If you and I could lose our salvation, if we could, it would be stated here. Because we'd say, do we continue in sin grace and we abound? The answer would be, no, because you'll lose your salvation. You'll die and go to hell if you do. It would be stated here, of all places, actually here and in the second question. He would have said, no, you, we, if you were to continue in sin, live a life of sin, you continue in that, you'll lose your salvation, and you'll go out and die and go to hell. But he doesn't do that. I want you to notice what he says. He asks this question, that grace may abound. Do we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, by no means. He says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? So how does Paul answer this? He says, we have, when we came to faith in Jesus, something changed. Something fundamentally changed about us. We died. The, the sinful part of us died. And, and that's what he says. How can we live in something that we're dead to anymore? It's kind of like, you know, the butterfly? You have a caterpillar, and a caterpillar goes into what is called a chrysalis stage, right? goes into this, and we, I, we actually have one on our front porch. It just fell out of the tree, sitting there on the front porch. And you see that thing. He's in that chrysalis, and he goes, he's a worm, and he goes in that chrysalis, and then he becomes a butterfly. And, but he's been changed. It's like the butterfly trying to live like the worm again. He can't do it. He's changed. And, and any Christian who's living as a sinner, it's living back in their sins, is a person that's trying to live a dead life. And, and what Paul is saying is, we've been dead. We've been crucified to that. We're dead to that life. It no longer has this meaning. You know what? Jesus ruins a life of sin for you. If you've come to Christ, living in sin has been ruined. Trust me. I tried it. I've, I've pursued it. I've done as hard as I could to try to live in that, in that life. And I learned it's dead. It's dead to me. And I tell you, you will be a failure as a sinner if you've come to faith in Christ. Because that life is dead to you. Does that mean we don't sin? No, we, we still sin. You ever had somebody, ever had a tooth that was pulled and it's still, you could still feel it was there? They call it ghost pangs. Jennifer had an uncle. He had his leg amputated. And did you know, it's the most miserable thing. He hasn't, he had, he had his leg amputated from the knee down and he would have to scratch his foot. But his foot's not there. How is it that he has, and you can't scratch it. It's, it's there. I mean, and this is the way it is with a Christian. You're, this is a dead life, this sinful life. It's dead to you, but it still haunts you. It still wants to come back. It still wants you to live according to it. But folks, I'm going to tell you something. It's gone. It's dead. It's crucified. And that's what he's talking about. He says, how, how can you live any longer in it? He says, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Think about this for a moment. Do we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, grace actually kills us from that life, and grace puts us on to a new life. After a while, you begin to learn that this new life, if we begin to live this new life, it works. The old life doesn't work. Um, the old life doesn't work. Now, let me say this. If my motivation in ceasing from sin is to keep my salvation, then I'm not trusting Christ for salvation, but I'm trusting my own works. 
Your salvation is a done deal if you are in Christ. It's done. Now, I had my life, my teen years, I was somewhat schizophrenic. Now, some of you might be like this. Uh, on one, one hand, I enjoyed, I was a Christian. I had Christ in my life. On one hand, I enjoyed the things of my life, of, of the world. I like to listen to ACDC. I like listening to Van Halen. I like listening to those. I enjoy those things. Ozzy Osbourne was my, one of my favorite. Randy Rhodes, one of my favorite guitars. Still like, I still like him. But this is what I used to seek after. I went after those things. I had a teeter-totter lifestyle. I'd go here, and, and because it was easy to do, it was my default mode, I'd go to this life, and it, I got frustrated with it. It just didn't work for me. And then I went back and started praying again, started reading the Bible. Oh, it feels good. And then finally, it got to a point where, I, oh, God, you're asking me too much. I don't want to do that. And then I go back to the old way. And then I kept going back and forth. back The teeter-totter lifestyle. You up where you are? Are you in that teeter-totter lifestyle? You're living, you kind of have, take pleasure in the world, have, have but, but uh, I believe it was um, Sammy Hagar, Hagar in Van Halen, the best of both worlds, right? You know that song. He's living for himself, and he wants to go to heaven, but he, and all that kind of thing. I think we have that struggle. I think every believer has that struggle until finally one day you get fed up, and that's what happened with me. I got fed up. I said, okay, Lord, I've had enough of this. I'm going to go ahead and live for you until it hurts even further, until it goes past. And you know what? I experienced a, a growth. I've experienced a dynamic of life that I never experienced before. I, this, this, there's a struggle between the flesh and the spirit, the Bible teaches, that you're going to have. But we must realize that as we seek that life, it's a dead life. It has nothing, it has nothing to offer us. It's gone. But as we begin to seek the life, the new life, it satisfies and brings us peace. Verse 5 through 7, dead means we're set free. Verse 5, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he dies, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, to, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God. Christ died once, and once he's dead. He's free. You're free from sin's dominion. You don't have. You're not a slave anymore when you're dead. <laughs> but he says he's alive unto God. Here's the reality: once we're saved, once we've put to death our our flesh, and now we're alive unto God, we can hear God speak. We can hear Spirit when we read the Scriptures. God speaks to us. We can sense His closest nearness. When we pray, we can sense. God's presence when we pray. We're alive unto God. It's, we live in a new reality. A new reality. We've been put to death, been Christ on the cross, but now we're alive. It's a new reality. You cannot lose that. You cannot undo that reality. I said once before, to lose your salvation would be like trying to unfry an egg. You have been fundamentally changed with a heart that loves God, with a heart that will fellowship with God. Now, we don't always do that. Sometimes we follow our old self. But the Scriptures always teach us to try to put away with the old self and to live for God. So he says here, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive unto God in Christ. That's the first step to the secret of living for Christ is to consider yourselves dead, to think about it. Consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God. We have to change how we think about ourselves. That I'm no longer a slave to sin. I, and I'm no longer a person, I have to do this. No, you're dead. You don't have to do that. It is no longer your master. You're dead to it. 
but now you're alive unto God. In fact, in the rest of the chapter, he actually says we are not just, not just that we're not slaves to sin, but we are slaves to righteousness. We cannot help but want to do righteousness, desire righteousness. Now look what he says in the remaining part of this. Verse 12. Do not let sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. So shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, we, we're dead to sin. It's a dead life. But he says, don't let sin rule anymore. Those phantom pains that keep coming at you, say no to it. Don't let sin rule. And then he says, now present your bodies, your members. Presenting means make myself available to God. Make myself available for his use. All of you here this morning, you're sitting in this church. You're making your bodies available to worship God. Now, we make our bodies available every morning. When we get up, we have our quiet time, read the Scriptures. We're making ourselves available to Him. We're presenting our members to His service. we got some people working at kids club, with, the, with the kids' club. You're making yourself available to that ministry. You make yourself available when you come to Sunday school and study the Bible. You make yourself available to God, even throughout the day. When you see somebody along the road, when you hear an ambulance go by, and when you stop for just a moment to pray for that person, you are presenting yourself to God for His use. So that's what he said, making yourself available to Him. Presenting yourself to God is an act of worship. It is your worship to God. So we're dead to sin, but now we're alive unto God. Alive never to die again. Alive to obey a new master. A new master that's gracious to you, that sets you free. Jesus says, he that has my teaching, it's he who is my really my disciple, and you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The only way you can be set free is by the simple decision of placing faith in Jesus. Now, every day, Christian, we are all faced with a decision every single day. Am I going to yield? Am I going to present myself? to my old flesh, to sin, to do things for that? Or am I going to present myself to God and to do what he wants me to do? We have a daily decision. Jesus said, Luke 9, 23, says, anyone who wants to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. It's a daily, moment-by-moment decision. I don't always make that decision to follow Christ. But there are times I do. I know that when, once I dis- get serious about God, about the Lord, my relationship with Him, I begin to follow Him and make, make more consistent, simple decisions. Back in, back in 1989, 1990, I made the decision when I got up in the morning, I would surrender my life, my day to Christ. I'd make myself available. I said, God, I'm available for whatever you want me to do. It's when we do that, God, I'm dead to myself. It was when we make ourselves available to him is when we begin to see life, when we can see him, uh, his life in and through us, when we begin to experience his life through us. And the baptism is a picture. It's a picture of a person who's standing, when they're standing in the tank, they're standing up, it's a picture of them nailing their sins to Christ on the cross. They're dying to themselves and their sins. And when I put the person under the water, it's a showing. It's a sign of their burial. They're being buried. Their sins are put into the ground. And when you bring that person up, it's a sign of their new life. They're now alive in Christ. They're new, a new life. And now every person that has, goes into baptism, we hope, we pray, that that person has received that new life, that spiritually they have died to themselves and now they're alive unto God. They fundamentally changed. Something that wasn't exciting before, now is incredibly exciting. Reading Scripture, you know, most people say, I remember one time, Mary Ellis, I was ri- riding on the church bus, going home one time, I was reading the Proverbs, 
I enjoyed reading the Proverbs. And I said, man, this is really cool. I gave it to Mary Ellis next to me. And I said, hey, read this, read this. This is really cool. She read it. Yeah, it's pretty boring, isn't it? I said, what? This isn't boring. It was speaking to me. Speaking to me. God was speaking to me through that verse. For those who are not spiritually alive, this is all worthless and useless and dead to them. But when we come to that place where we die to ourselves and we say yes to Jesus and we're now made alive, the Bible comes alive. We want to read it. We're with those group of people, that, that church, those weird group of people. We begin to love some of those people. There's something about them. When I was a kid, when I go to church, when I go to church, I absolutely loved it. Walking in a church building, meeting old people. There's old people there. There's young people there. I loved it because I saw Christ in that church. When you're alive into God, you begin to sense those other people who are alive into God, and you want to be around them. You want to talk about Jesus. So baptism is a symbol. It's a sign of somebody who's experienced a change in their life, spiritually. On the inside, they've been made spiritually alive. I have a, a wedding ring on. I can't get it off because since I put it on, I got fat, okay? I can't get it off, which is great. I don't want to get it off, all right? But this wedding ring, ring, if I was to lose this wedding ring, if I was to lose my finger or my hand, it doesn't mean I'm not married anymore. The wedding ring is just a symbol. It's a symbol that I married somebody. There's somebody else who has a ring on that says I belong to her and she belongs to me. A wedding ring is a symbol, and baptism is a symbol that says, I belong to Christ, and I want you all to know about it. It's a symbol that I've died to myself, and now I'm alive into God. And you cannot undo that. You are eternally secure if you come to faith in Christ. Simply, radically, just by believing and trusting that Jesus died for your sins, and asking Him to forgive you of those sins, and repenting of those sins. Now, here's the thing. You're not, you're not going to be perfect. You're going to look, some people look horrible. Some people look, a lot of times they look just like the world. But their soul has been changed. And it's hard to judge somebody. And it's very difficult to judge somebody at times. When they first come to faith in Christ, they, a person could be in a period of time in their life for a long time where they look like the world. They look like everybody else. And they seem like they live like everybody else. Until finally they come to that point, like me, when I came to that moment, I said, you know, I'm sick of tired of this. I want to live for Jesus now. And I still slide back at times. The teeter-totter. And this morning, maybe you are a teeter-totter Christian. You've just been going back and forth. Um, you're saved. Jesus saved you by His grace. By His works, you're saved. But you've not made a decision to dedicate yourself to Him. Because if you love for you, not really dedicate yourself to live in the reality that he called you into. You've been living contrary to who you are. And you've just been, been back and forth. I want to encourage you to stop going back and forth. To start in every day, every morning, just like Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, to commit your life to him every day. To surrender to him every day. God, whatever it is today, whatever you have for me today, I surrender it to you. And maybe this morning, you've been trying to work, and you've been thinking maybe God, God will never forgive you for what you've done. Maybe you think maybe this morning you think that somehow, uh, yeah, God may have something to do with these other people, but he will never have anything to do with me. That's not true. Jesus is all who come to me, I will not cast away. Scripture says, Jesus says, he that hears my words and believes him who sent me, has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. It's just like that. There's no going climbing this mountain and getting the special flower. There's none of that stuff. It's simply knowing that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and asking Him, inviting Him to forgive you, to be cleansed from those sins. That's all you need all you need. You don't need to make a promise and say, God, I'll, I'll live for you the rest of my life. No, 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 no. What, what will happen is the moment you came to faith in Jesus, you're going to die, and you're going to have a new life that's been placed in you, and that life is going to start 
hammering and hammering. And you're going to start having to live for that life, consistent with that life. It'll bug you. It'll bother you. Anyway, I'm rambling on. I'm rambling on. Have you come to faith in Christ? Are you trusting and depending on Jesus? Because that's what it will take. And this morning also, uh, we have a baptistry right here. If you've not been baptized, you've been, you've been saved, you've asked Christ into your life, but you're not taking that step. Make the plunge. God always asks us to do a public commitment. God always asks for us to go public. There are sometimes we hide. We, we become a Christian silently. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, these guys were silent Christians, but eventually they became public. And so Jesus always asks us, always asks us to be bold in our stance. And this is your first step of being bold toward Christ. If you have asked Christ into your life, if he lives in you, this is your step. This is your step of obedience. And maybe this morning also, uh, you just, you've been baptized. You've been baptized believers. About it. Maybe you just need to join a church, our church. I want to encourage you to do that. Whatever God is speaking to your heart about, I want to encourage you to pray about that. Okay? All right. Well, let's pray. And then um, I think John and Don are going to do the invitation.